the collector tank alternative. So that's our next alternative in looking at this um, option of collecting solar. Um, and so this is a schematic of it where we have a tank or some sort of fluid, likely water, but there could be other fluids, and it's indoors, so it could be below the roof. Uh, we pipe up to the roof with a pump and we go to some sort of collector and our fluid goes to the collector, warms up and goes back into the tank. And we'd like to do that all day. Uh, in particular, most of from say 9.30 a.m. to about 3 p.m. or even later and have a lot of hot fluid at the end of the day that could be used in the evening in the next morning. But well, how well is it gonna work? I'm reminded of, um, you know, when I coached basketball for a long time and uh, there was always like a different offense that people were talking, oh, this is the better offense, this is offense we should run. And there are advantages of different offenses in basketball, but a lot of it is the components you select and how you link it all together. And the same thing is here. Um, there's the components you select. How big a tank do you use? What kind of fluid do you use inside that tank? What pump rate do you do? You know right now the crucial thing is we got to get the pump rate so that when the water goes through the collector, it's turbulent flow. That's essential. And then what type of collector? So um, a little bit more on what type of collector um, for the next few minutes. So basically when we have a collector, some questions we wanna ask is the water goes through or the fluid goes through, what's the delta T? Um, what rate do we collect energy per square foot of collector? And of course, what's our rate of energy collection? This might be in something like BTUs per hour. All right. Uh, we have basic equations to allow to work with that, but we'd like to understand how those equations apply for different types of collectors. So method one, this represents a collector. If you remember uh, last week, I went outside and showed you a collector and basically we just got a tube and the water goes through that tube like that. Okay, um, that's going to work pretty well, but how is it going to work when it gets really, real, when that water gets really hot? We have systems out there where we would like in the afternoon the water to get up to say even like 160 degrees Fahrenheit. That might be a bit high in some cases, but for sure we want over 100. Well, the case that I had outside, just the tubing, the black tubing connected to fins, there's gonna be problems when it gets warmer because while um, there's gonna be solar that comes in, there's also gonna be the out, okay? And what is the out? The convection plus the emission. The convection plus the emission. So we got this, this whole sort of tension here that um, we want to, for a collector, we would like good in and we would like, and we would like to limit the out. Okay, so the next option we're gonna look at is what's called a glazed flat plate collector. And that's what I went to actually when I went to the solar website. How does that change? Well, basically what we just do is we put some glass or some sort of other transparent material right there. Okay, how does that do with the out? Well, if you think about it, if this is 160 degree water, this plate here is gonna be close to 160. Let's say the air up here is something like 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, the out is going to be largely via convection, some emission, okay? And now with this glazed plate here, the, there can, we can trap some hot air in here that means that the convection is limited. So a huge advantage of doing the um, flat plate option with a glazing cover is that we limit the convection out. Okay, hey, how does that do with the end then? Okay, what about the amount that gets in compared to no cover? Well, glass is not perfectly transparent. You can get glass that's really pretty good at letting solar through, but there's no way it's perfectly transparent. Some is gonna bounce off. Some of this incident solar is gonna bounce off. And as a consequence, glazed flat plate limits the out, but also decreases, decreases the in. And how does it work out? Well, it's situational, which one's better? In some cases, it's better to go with unglazed. In some better cases, it's better to go with glazed. All right, third main option, okay, third main option. Take this tubing here that the water's going through and it's getting really, really hot and do something to cut down almost entirely on the convection. Well, convection is from a surface to a gas. If there's any way we could eliminate the gas up here, then we wouldn't get any convection. What's a way to eliminate the gas? Have a vacuum. So there's the option of an evacuated tube collector, 
where there's a vacuum here and a vacuum here, and that essentially prevents almost all convection going out. Hey, what about radiation or emission? Is that gonna prevent emission? Well, emission can travel through a vacuum, so we're gonna still get emission. So we're gonna still get an out, but with an evacuated tube collector, we're not gonna get an in. So before we look at the math, let's take a look in a little bit more detail at um, some, uh, those two other options. So this first one that I got going on here is the glaze flat plate. So it is very similar to that collector we looked at before where we've got cold water in, it splits and goes through small tubing where the tubing is going to result, the, the small diameter is gonna result in turbulent flow, okay? We got this glazing sheet of up there that will let the solar radiation through, but it's gonna trap hot air in there, and so that's gonna limit the convection. And that is a very standard solution, works great, there's a lot of options um, and some particulars to get into, but in short, that, that is um, probably the number one option out there. An option that we're seeing a lot more these days is this, okay? So that is the evacuated tube option. And this is a simplified version of it, but basically we got the cold water going in, we have the sun penetrating the glass tubing, and of course going through the vacuum, and then it warms up that water, when that water gets hot, it ordinarily would give up heat to surrounding air, but it's in a vacuum, so there's no surrounding air. It loses heat only by emission, and that does great at limiting the out. Well, just like everything in engineering, there's lots of options. Which option's best? It depends on the situation. And let's take a look at one situation. So. Over here, I got a situation where it's cold outside. The blue is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. There's some good solar. That 220 is going to be BTH per foot squared. And we've got 150 degree water that we want to warm up. How is that going to turn out in different situations? Uh, 150 degree water, that may seem um, an unusual goal, uh, but um, it, there's a lot of bottling plants out there that do sterilization. And that's one good example where we want, even if we had 150 degree water in our tank, we'd still want to warm it up. And 220 BTH per foot squared, that's good solar. All right, so to remind you how this all works, there is one example, one version of our collection equation that to get the collection, we're going to take this factor times G. And you can think of this like the gain number right here like this, okay? But we're also going to lose some if the water is warmer than the ambient temperature. And this would be convection and maybe also a bit of an emission term. Good rough ways of thinking about it. In this case, we definitely have water that's warmer in the air. So how's the, how are the numbers gonna work out? Well, it's gonna depend on the nature of the collector. So let's start with unglazed, okay? Unglazed has a good gain number. 82, 0.82 would be a typical number, but it also has a pretty high loss number in some cases. So I've got a negative 1.37. I haven't done the units, but this unit right here, this term right here is unitless, and this term right here is um, BTH per foot squared per degree Fahrenheit temperature difference. Okay, so let's just go ahead and pull out our calculator and get that line filled out. If you, um, want to pause the video and see if you can do it yourself, that's fine. These two terms are not official terms that you would be asked to work out in the book or even on a homework assignment, but I'm saying the gain is going to be this term right here and the loss is going to be that term right there. So I'm going to punch in my calculator and see if I match you guys. I'm only going to go down to a decimal place or two. So I've got a gain of 180.4 here. Okay, how did I get that? I did the 0.82 times the, pardon me, the 0.82 times the 220 going in. Okay, how about the loss? Well, for the loss, I'm gonna do this negative 1.37, and I'm gonna multiply it by 150 minus 40. That's the way the formula works. The slope term, which is negative 1.37 times 150, the entering temperature minus the ambient temperature. So let me try that. So I've got a loss term of actually 150.7. Okay, 
Now, ordinarily you do this all in one step where you would actually calculate this term here, this term here, and sum them together. Actually, strictly making, speaking, you could think of this loss term as a negative, but don't, don't stress about that too much. Okay, adding them together, um, 180.4 minus 150.7. I got 29.7 net gain, and I'll, you guys, I'll switch pens on you in just a minute, so it's a little bit clearer, okay? And that number right there is BTH per square foot. So hopefully you can see that's a little bit disappointing at 29.7 because we've got a 220 gain there. All right, let me just pause for a second and see if I can get a better pen for you guys. Hang on just a minute, please. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. And actually, I'm, even, I'm back. I even changed the number on you. I'm going to make the slope a little bit more extreme, which means that this collector here would be something that tends to lose its heat pretty easily. Okay, and so I'm going to get the same gain, 180.4. That's going to make the loss 183.3. And it turns out that we're losing more energy in this case than we're gaining. And that, of course, could happen. If you, if you just think about it logically, if you took hot water and put it through a pipe, even if the sun was hitting it, it could lose more energy than it gains, but then the loss would be largely by convection. So we get a net gain of negative 3.3, and we're gonna get a negative efficiency. And so a reminder for you guys, the efficiency, sorry about that, the efficiency is a ratio of our net gain, our overall gain that comes from this equation to the intensity of the incoming solar radiation. So I would do negative 3.3, and divided by 220. Let me just try that really quickly. Negative 3.3 divided by 220. And I get a negative 1.5% efficiency, which means, which, re which reflects the fact, sorry about my writing, which reflects the fact that it's losing energy. Great. Well, not so good. But in any case, those are how the numbers work out. Okay, what if we changed and we said, look, this number here is really, really a problem. Let's come up with an alternative to cut down the convection loss. Well, the next best thing to do is to put some glass on top of that collector. Okay, so how the number is gonna work out differently if it's glazed? Well, certainly you can look up the numbers that we got last time um, because that's the performance numbers I got were for a glazed flat plate. There's lots of different possibilities. This was just in the realm of possibility. Notice that it's not as severe a loss as the unglazed. So that's an improvement. Okay, what should happen to the y-intercept value? Well, that's a, get a sense of how well we're doing at, of the solar energy getting in. And it's gonna be worse because we've got glass over it and glass actually reflects some light. It's really hard to get decent, strong glass that lets in 100% of the solar. So in this case here, we're gonna go with an 0.68 and see how those numbers work. All right, so pulling back a little bit, see if you can take it through yourself. Work out the gain, work out the loss, work out the net, and work out the efficiency. Well, the numbers worked out better here. So the bottom line are maybe these last two columns right here. Um, for the previous example, unglazed, we were losing energy. Now we're gaining 49.5 BTH per square foot for an efficiency of 23%, all right? But taking a look at some details, um, I got a gain number of 149.6, that's worse. And so the idea is less of the solar is getting in. On the other hand, I got a loss of only about 100, so we're losing less. And the net then are those two numbers there like that. So glazed in this case is looking superior because we're cutting off the loss. What about evacuated too? Let's take a look at how all that works next. So the point on the evacuated tube is that we're gonna decrease the loss. And so that slope term in the collector efficiency is negative 0.37. Okay, what about the y-intercept? Well, that's kind of interesting to think about. We do have glass and we do have a vacuum. But because of some geometrical considerations, which I'm not gonna do a great job on right now, but this would be like looking into one of those tubes. There's the glass tubing, vacuum here, vacuum here. There ends up being a smaller tube inside, so the fluid goes going through it is turbulent, and then we have these fins here like that. It turns out that the end does not work out as well. 
So instead of 0.68, a typical number is going to be 0.51. So taking a look, we just have this usual order where the gain terms decrease as we get, well, fancier or more expensive, but the loss terms go way down. And sometimes this, this extra expense to limit the loss term ends up being worth it. Why don't you go ahead and fill out those blanks yourself and I'll get the numbers up there. Well, for me, it worked out that this was the best, okay? So taking a look, the, the evacuated tube is this last number here. We are gaining four, uh, 71 BTH or 71.5 BTH per square foot. And in addition, we've got an efficiency of 33%. Um, our gain number is the lowest of the three. We're only gaining 112, but our loss is much, much less, and that works out for the best. So this is not a typical that if you do have a case where you're trying to get a fluid really, really hot, and it's combined by a case where we have low ambient temperatures, where there's a big difference between TI and TA, hey, a lot of times it's worth going with a little bit more expensive option. All right. It is situational though, so you're not always gonna get evacuated too. So here's a new situation. I realize my drawing's not great. I got it squeezed in there, but let's see if we can figure out what's going on. So first of all, TA, the ambient temperature is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It's summer now. Secondly, G is a little bit bigger, okay? And during the summer, our G's sometimes get bigger. And finally, we're pumping 80 degree water up to the roof. Um, what, what would be better in that case? Well, first of all, the scenario actually might be pool heating. And we have um, a really great pool heating system at Sac, at Sac State where the pool is entirely heated by solar. And um, which type of collector would work out in this case? Well, I want to work backwards. I want to say, let's go ahead and say, like, what if we started with the evacuated tube? How are those columns going to work out? What's the gain? What's the loss? What's the net? What's the efficiency? Go ahead and work through that quickly, and I'll get my numbers up there as well. Well, it worked out pretty well. I got 53% efficiency, uh, much better. But then this scenario is a lot better for solar. We're in a situation where it's not that cold outside and uh, we're not our our losses aren't going to be that great because it's only 80 degree water um so i got my game was 163.2 i put this 7.4 that i got by doing slope times ti minus ta in parentheses because actually strictly speaking if you think about it, it's a negative slope and ti minus ta is negative 20 you end up getting a when you calculate that number you end up being a positive number What's going on is this is actually a gain. So now this loss term over here is actually end up being the gain term. And what's going on is heat is flowing from the air into the water. So it's a gain. So we get 170.6 and 53%. So hey, maybe we should go with evacuative tube. That's our best percent yet. But why don't we go ahead and take a look at how the numbers work for the other two. Again, I've got the same efficiency and same slopes because those would be characteristics of, the man, of, this particular, of these particular collectors that have been certified by the manufacturer. Go ahead and fill those in. You should get that the um, unglazed collector wins. And um, so taking a look at the numbers, um, as we work our way from evacuated tubes, sorry about that, to um, glazed to unglazed, the gains get better. And of course, that's because there's less blocking the sun. Um, and so the unglazed is superior in that regard. And that was the case before. In addition, these numbers are now gains and the unglazed collector does a better job of actually gaining heats from the surrounding air. So we get really nice collection and we get fantastic efficiency, we get 92% efficiency. Try beating that with a PV panel, there's no way you can do that. And so um, when you think about so what's called solar thermal, taking sun and converting it into heat versus converting it into electricity, of course swimming pool is one of the, it's a natural to go with uh, solar thermal in that regard. All right. So one use of this simplified collector performance equation, and just a note on simplified, this works pretty well at modeling how a collector does. And I've used it for years and it's been around for years. Uh, it turns out that there's enough going on in solar that being a little bit more precise than that pays off sometimes. So there are equations that are more complex and more accurately modeled.
We're going to start with this, the simplified collect performance equation. So one thing we can do is we can use it to figure out what our collection is. But if we, in addition, we like to think about efficiency. As engineers, we like to think how efficient our, our system is. So remember, efficiency was Q useful divided by A, our BTH per fair foot squared collection per incoming radiation. And incoming radiation is G. So we would divide this by G to get efficiency. And if we could do it on this left side here, we got to do it on the right side. So there's our corresponding efficiency equation. Let me get it up there really quickly. So it turns out that it's useful to be able to understand this equation in order to get, it gives us a firmer sense of how an individual collector works. And usually the way it's actually represented is, we, is represented graphically. So where the y-axis is the efficiency of the collector and the x-axis is this other term here, ti minus ta over g. Okay, so I'd like you to take a stab at graphing the efficiency for one particular collector. So we're going to take a collector that has a typical y-intercept value of 0.6. It's pretty good at getting the sun into the water, not great. Its slope is negative one. By the way, these are English units, so this would be ETH per foot squared per degree Fahrenheit. Don't stress about that too much right now. We'll get you some practice on the homework on the details. Okay, so you got your graph and we're gonna go ahead and work it, work it out. Well, how would you go about doing it? What we would do is you would put in a bunch of possible values over here and see how it works out. Well, I'm gonna, let's, I'm gonna get you going and, and get you doing one. So why don't you go ahead and do the case where Ti, let's say our tank is 80 degrees. Sorry about that pen. Let's say our Ti is equal to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And sorry about my writing. And Ta, the ambient temperature, is equal to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, not great writing, but enough to get you going. Why don't you go ahead and see if you can get one point on the graph. So you're taking those values and you're gonna put it in. Hey, let me make up a G. Let's say G is 200, 200 BTH per foot squared. Okay, so this looks really, really intimidating, but let's just put 80 and 80 over here like this, 80 and TI, 80 and TA, and that's gonna be zero divided by G. This whole second term right here is gonna be Z, zero, and our efficiency is just going to be the Y-intercept term, which is almost like our baseline efficiency. So when, when, TI, when this X-axis term is zero, okay, the, the y value or the functional value is gonna be 0.6. So we're going to get a dot right there like that. And there's our first point. Okay, let me just, let's just conceptually do um, a different value. Let's say it's 80 degrees, but we send warmer value water up to the, warmer water up to the collector. Okay, I'd like you to pause for a second. And again, I know my writing is just a little bit messy. 100, but that's 180 and G is 200. Let's just go ahead and work out what the efficiency is using this efficiency equation, and I'll be doing it myself. Okay, so here's the math. I was working out the efficiency. Y-intercept is like a constant property of the collector. There's the slope. There's Ti minus Ta over G. That all turns out to be 0.1, and I get efficiency of 0.5. And hopefully we can make sense of what's going on there. Now there's hotter water going to the collector, hotter than the air. So we're gonna actually lose some heat by convection and maybe even a little bit more by radiation. And our model shows us that we're gonna have an efficiency of 0.5. Okay, we well, can put it on the graph. And you'll see that I got a lower point like that. And for homework, I'll have you just do a little bit of work like that. What you're gonna end up getting with this equation, it's a linear equation and you're gonna get a graph that slopes downwards. And hopefully what it says to you is that the hotter the water is versus the ambient temperature, the lower our efficiency is gonna be. Hey, what if we really quickly, what if we reverse these numbers, okay? 
what if we sent 80 degree water up and the ambient temperature was 100 degrees Fahrenheit? How would that actually end up working out? Well, it's over here, then we're gonna have 0.6, we're gonna have negative one. These numbers are gonna reverse, so it's actually going to be 80 minus 100 over 200. So these numbers over here are gonna be negative 0.1, and we're gonna get an efficiency of 0.7. So it turns out when manufacturers publish these graphs, they sometimes do negative values on the x-axis, which shows that we can get really high efficiency if the water is uh, if the water is cooler than the air temperature. All right, a little bit of work on that on homework, and these graphs will become meaningful to you. Now we know enough to get back to this tank model and evaluate how it's doing. So, um, taking a look at a particular example that I'd like us to work through. Um, let's get the example up there, then I'll remind you of the theory. Um, we're going to get a tank and we'll pick a size. I'm going with 60 gallons. Okay? We're going to pump up to a collector. Okay? The collector is going to be hit by solar G. There's going to be some ambient air temperature, and we're going to go back down. Okay, We've got to choose collector area. That collector that I had outside was 30 square feet. Let's say we go with two of them. We've got the money to go with two of them. Okay? I went for the moderate collector values here. The y-intercept value, like the fraction of solar that gets into that water, is 0.7. Um, that would be typical of glazed plate. And the slope is negative 0.8. That would also be typical of, of glazed plate. Not as good as evacuated tube, but not, not as good as unglazed. Okay, the first equation, of course, you have again, you, you've seen many, many times. We're going to calculate how much heat gets into our water, our QU over A overall by using that equation. And then to model what's going on, what we're gonna say is that that heat that gets into the water, that ends up going into the tank and warms the tank. And so what we, to do this modeling, what we need to do is use that idea that the Q useful goes to the tank and warms the tank. And we can work on an hour by hour basis and figure out how much heat gets into the tank and then during the hour, figure out what the change in temperature of the tank is, and then work from there. Hey, let's, there, you may have some questions about details on this model, but let's go ahead and get going and get started. So let's just go ahead and give you some data. Let's say we're starting our model at 10 a.m. in the morning, okay? And the tank temperature, let's say, is kind of so-so. Let's say it's like about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And the ambient temperature is 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And we've got pretty good solar, let's say 250 BTH per foot squared. Okay, well, you've got the first thing you've got to do is do Q useful, and I'll be working on that myself. And we'll come back together and take a look at how that turned out. Okay, so the first thing I did actually was um, I used this equation here. So I did 0.7 times 250. And then I did negative 0.8 times um, the difference was 75 minus 55. And I got a Q useful over A. Hang on for a second. Let me just try that out myself. On my calculator of 159 BTH per foot squared. So actually, we are doing really good. 250 BTH per foot squared is hitting that collector, and 159 is getting in. But to do these tank problems, we're not interested just in how much per square foot, but we're interested in how much gets into this water. And so I need to take this nine, this 159 that's on my calculator and multiply it by 60 square feet. So that's how I got that number there, right there like that, 9540. Okay, I'm gonna add one column and I'm to get that up there. I'm gonna get the efficiency just to see how good that efficiency is. And it should be something less than 0.7. Let's see how that turns out. Okay, I got efficiency of 64%. And so that means we're doing really, really well. But what, I'm sorry, I messed up this drawing over here. But what's going on basically is there's not a lot of difference between the tank temperature and the air temperature. Okay, one thing I didn't explain very well, in this equation, or didn't explain actually as much as I should have, in this equation here, what do we use for TI, the inlet temperature to the collector? And the idea is, um, pardon me, let me just redraw this here. Over, give me just a second, please. Okay, this tank started out the hour 
at 75 degrees right there like that. Well, this is 75 degrees that goes through the pump and goes up to that collector. Usually this piping is well insulated. So the water that actually comes up here and enters the collector is gonna be the same as the tank temperature. Sorry, I should have said that, but when you do this sort of modeling, assume for now, and probably for professional work that you'll do, that the tank temperature and the inlet temperature are the same thing. Okay, how about delta T of the tank? Again, delta T is good for any body that doesn't change phase is the energy that's gonna to go to that body, and in this case, we can consider that heat energy, divided by the product of the mass of our body and its specific heat. Well, specific heat is easy. That's one, BTU per pound mass degree Fahrenheit. How about the mass of the tank? Well, you can use that rough rule a lot of times in this class that a pound of water is, pardon me, a gallon of water is about 8.33 pounds. 60 gallons here times 8.33, that should pretty much give you 500 pounds of water. So we can take this 9540, sorry about that, 9540 BTUs, okay, and divide it by 500 times one, and that's gonna give us the delta T of the tank. So let me just try that myself. Okay, and I got a 19 degree Fahrenheit delta T. So 19 degree Fahrenheit delta T. I might wanna put plus up there. All right, well, um, it's very tempting to say, oh, this is a 64% efficiency, and I can then just take all the solar that's hitting all day, and I can, there's data I could look up in order to get that number and multiply it by 64%. But of course, the numbers change all day. Now, the way we're thinking about it is that over the course of this hour, this temperature is going to bump up by 19. Well, if we're sending warmer t water up here, it's going to be less efficient. And then also, of course, during the day, the ambient temperature in the G will change. So I'm um, sorry about that. That, that drawing get gets, is getting a little bit um, messy. But basically, in short, what you need to do in these models is work hour by hour. Obviously, this lends itself to Excel, but let's do one more typical case, all right? So here we go, let's do 11 a.m. That's what you would do next. Okay, from weather data, I could get what the new temperature is. Well, sometimes from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., it really starts warming up. So I'm gonna say it's gotten up to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, what would G be like? Well, if this is a south facing collector, now it might be more directly towards it. So I'm gonna make this 310. That's really getting in there. How about T tank? What's T tank gonna be? Well, that comes from this line. We started out the hour at I'm sorry, 75 degrees, okay? And then it warmed up by 19 degrees during the hour. So this is going to be 94 degrees. And now we can go through the whole line. Why don't you give it a shot to get these last three things and then that'll do it for today's lecture. All right, so here's the number I, I got. Um, we ended up collecting 11,722. Another uh, important point. These actually would be in BTUs per hour because G, is BTH or BTUs per hour per square foot, and then I'm multiplying by 60 square feet, and these are BTUs per hour. Well, usually this equation here, this value of, this value of Q is in BTUs, but we can make that jump really, really easily. This is BTUs per hour, and we're thinking of this as essentially lasting for the whole hour. So this number right here in BTUs per hour is the BTUs that goes to the tank. That's why one reason it's really nice working hour per hour. Okay, I got a larger collection, therefore a larger delta T, okay? I got pretty much the same efficiency, but it did go down. And that's in part now because we're sending warmer water to the roof. Okay, and then of course, what we would do is we would just keep going. And the most, probably the next basic step is to get what's the tank temperature gonna be at the start of the 12th hour? Well, it started, it, we, we were at 95, it warmed by 23.5. And so let's see if I can do that in my head just to finish things off. So you see 7.5, 117.5 degrees Fahrenheit. We're on our way to a pretty warm temperature. Okay, that's a really great start. What I encourage you to do is uh, get homework number eight done. Um, that gives you some practice with this stuff. And next week, our first lecture is going to be another one of those Excel spreadsheets where we put this try it all together and try to make it work. So be safe. Um, I'll be in touch with you guys. Have a great weekend.